Okay, well, thank you. My name is Mark Thomas. I head up strategic alliances and marketing for RightCell. We're a company that makes a platform for new mobility, car sharing uh, and ride sharing. And what I wanted to talk to you today was building on Alex's theme of new mobility and how it's going to affect our lives. This, we've heard a lot about uh, cases or your case or ACEs. There's this acronym that's essentially connected, autonomous, electric, and on-demand. Uh, and really, it's the combination of autonomous plus on-demand plus EV together that form what I call this triple disruption. Now, any one of them is a powerful disruption in themselves. But it's, it's when all of them join to the serendipitous uh, uh, confluence that things really make a big change. And if we take a look now, I'm from San Francisco, and if you live in San Francisco, you think that the entire world has already gone to Uber and Lyft. Uh, but the reality is about 1% of all passenger miles driven in the world today are in shared mobility services. It's at the infancy of this market. Um, by 2030 in North America and in Europe, that's expected to be about a third of all miles. If you look at the growth driver, uh, it's the autonomous uh, ride hailing that becomes the true growth. There's still roughly 10% that will be driven uh, in bad weather. Uh, if you want somebody to help you, uh, there's higher end services where the driver will absolutely make a difference. But it's the autonomous <laughs> mobility combined with on demand plus EV, which you know, saves you another 10 cents a mile cost, uh, brings the cost of using the service down to below the cost of owning a vehicle. And that becomes the tipping point. That becomes the part where usage takes off. Now, this is, you know, spoken from somebody who lives in an urban area. In fact, in North America, uh, if you look at the, that's primarily where the initial use will come from. Somewhere between 2025 and 2030, uh, these gray bars are the private uh, purchase vehicles, and the green bars, or the green section of the bars, are vehicles that are purchased by mobility services. So you can see that even though uh, auto automobile sales may not be taking as much of a dip in the future, who's buying the vehicles is going to dramatically change, and that's going to have some profound implications, especially if you look at the buyer power of the people of the few services that are going to be buying lots and lots of different vehicles. The, and this slide, we see that you know, part of the reason this is such a hot topic is that there will be a huge amount of wealth created when this happens. The gray bars are the part of the market caps of all the automotive OEMs for their business around selling vehicles. The green bars is the value of new mobility service companies. Now, you know, first it was, you know, pretty powerful because the, in 2030, that's a nine trillion dollar market cap for these companies, six times larger than the market cap of OEMs in their, their vehicle business. And part of that's driven because there's, it's an expectation that there'll be about a trillion dollars worth of revenue, nine times market cap, brings us to this nine trillion dollar number. But it's also the fact that a lot of these service providers are going to be rolling up different industries. So if you're taking uh, a, a ride in an autonomous uh, cab, you're not worrying about washing the car anymore. You're not worrying about maintaining the car. You actually don't even insure the car. These are things that you're getting from the service providers. So those guys are able to roll up multiple different industries, which is why a number of these companies are looking to expand into this. If you take a look at uh, the mobility as a service evolution, we've gone from the, you know, the sharing economy with car sharing, and then you know, more recently the service economy with, with ride sharing, there's a natural tendency to think, well, for me to get to uh, autonomous ride hailing, that's just another form of service economy, so that means I need to get in the business of being ride sharing today to capitalize on this. But if you look along the bottom axis, that's primarily vehicles that are driven. And when you take the driver out, it actually changes the axis entirely. Autonomous ride hailing starts to become a completely different beast that means that you don't have to go and become a ride 
sharing company today to be prepared for the autonomous ride hailing market opportunity. Remember, the green box here is the same as the, the big green boxes uh, for the market and wealth created. Uh, if you think about what the ride sharing companies today are good at, they're good at recruiting and retaining drivers. If you get into the car sharing business today, you are actually having to learn how to buy a fleet of vehicles, how to maintain them, how to keep them clean, and it's far more relevant than uh, learning how to recruit and retain these drivers. So the companies that, that we're working with are the ones who realize, hey, we're in it for this autonomous pot of gold. And what's the best way to get there? Well, looks like the best way to get there is through car sharing. Now, this is a relatively transformative time we're in. And, uh, we just heard General Motors come up here and talk about their initiative with Maven. Absolutely, they're some of the most visible companies uh, Ford has done an amazing job of capitalizing on Ford mobility. Uh, the dealers are in an interesting position right now because the General Motors is here establishing direct connections to customers, building up a new brand, potentially disintermediating the dealership. And so the dealers are starting to think, hey, if people stop buying the asset and start using it as an on-demand thing, we've seen how this plays out. That's blockbuster video. Nobody owns CDs and DVDs anymore. They just get it from Netflix. Or they get it from their on-demand provider. So the dealers themselves are coming to us and saying, hey, what can we do? Because we actually have service bays. We have access to vehicles, and we have local market knowledge. We should be the ones to create these new mobility services, not somebody in corporate deciding to look into my market. Other companies and in other industries, like automobile clubs, uh, the, the Automobile Club of Northern California came to us and said, hey, our strategy group has determined that this is not a long-term viable business for us. The average age of our customer is 62, and next year it'll be 63. And pretty soon they're going to stop driving. And what happens to all those membership fees? So they came to us and said, hey, we want to do something relevant to millennials. We want to get into the car sharing business. And so they opened up uh, in the San Francisco area and have been wildly successful, you know, doubling the size of their fleet and moving into multiple cities now. Auto insurance companies are in the same boat. If autonomous vehicles end up causing fewer accidents, the auto, auto insurance industry starts to lose revenue. And then even related industries, such as, you know, how is this going to affect rental car companies? Uh, electricity companies are talking to us now. Initially, it was about how do they become part of the charging infrastructure because as we've seen, it's really about these e-fleets. These e-vehicles e uh, e are the ones that are going to be the cheapest, most reliable, and lowest cost to run. And when you get these longer range vehicles like the Bolt, those have the ability to go several days without needing a charge. And then you know, not having to worry about charging infrastructure along the way, being able to take those cars out of service overnight and then bring them back in the morning, uh, these energy companies are realizing, hey, maybe I should just run the service. Uh, because it's, you know, we're good at providing large-scale things with, with uh, you know, working out the cost to keep these things as, as affordable as possible. So a market entry strategy that we've been recommending is you start off with car sharing. And this is, there's two kinds of car sharing. There's the kind that uh, Zipcar made famous, which is every car has a station, and it's, we consider it round trip. You go to the car, and you take the car, and then you bring it back. Uh, then there's a modern style called um, free-floating, or some, some it's called one-way car sharing. That's where a car can essentially get picked up in one spot and dropped off anywhere else in the city. Car to go, drive now, uh, reach now, these are all services that have this more modern free-floating style. Uh, but there's absolutely the benefit of having a station-based car sharing, especially in some like apartment complexes. People move in, they think, well, okay, I just moved to a new city, do I need a car? Oh, there's eight of them here that are, are for use exclusively by the people who live here. So that's an example of being able to use car sharing. And those get some of the highest utilization rates ever. Those are somewhere like you know, 40 to 45 percent. Now, adding in ride sharing becomes important because being able to learn about how do you move drivers around, pick them up, uh, we power BMW's ReachNow service in Seattle and Portland. And they have one fleet of cars, and they do. They started off by doing car sharing, and then they hired chauffeurs. And so these are people that they put white gloves on. They're in these beautiful BMW 3 Series vehicles, 
and they have a very high level of service. And it may cost as much as an Uber Black, but the idea is some people are willing to pay for high service, but in Seattle it's not particularly a benefit to show up in a Cadillac Escalade in an environmentally conscious uh, society. So here they've been able to get experience not just with car sharing and maintaining their fleet, but also with ride sharing. Now being able to connect with other car sharing fleets is important. In the same way that the airline industry has, uh, when I fly to Berlin, I take a United flight and buy a United ticket, but then I land in, in Frankfurt and then I'm on a Lufthansa flight. <coughs> being able to have these different networks of vehicles so that every time you land in a new city, you don't have to download a new app is an important part of making using these car sharing services frictionless. And then being able to add in autonomous vehicles um, where they're you know, not offering rides at $1.50 a mile, but you're offering rides at $0.25 cents a mile. That's where the uh, market takes off because the decision to, to use a ride-sharing service versus your own car uh, becomes obvious that it's much cheaper just to take the service. And one of the things that's key to running a profitable service is that you need to use one fleet of vehicles and power multiple different business models. So we saw with GM Maven, they've got the city, they've got home, uh, they've got gig. And so ideally, these services would all use a single pool of vehicles. Because if you take a look at, at the car sharing that we do for ride sharing drivers, so people like to rent our cars and use them when they, they take them on and use Uber and Lyft, that demand for those is in the evening. If you take a look at these station-based vehicles, those tend to have demand in the morning, the, the access across the bottom is, is time. And then just typical car sharing by itself is one way thing has yet a different curve. So the way to get the most profit out of it is to, to use the vehicles for when they're most in demand. So put them on the, the street when they're during the day and then turn them into ride-sharing vehicles in the evening. Same thing is true uh, for mobility services on days of the week. Um, the weekends aren't as popular, it's midweek, but with the residential car sharing, people love to take them out for the weekend. And then, you know, the typical cars that are strewn about the street don't have as much of a demand uh, based on day of the week. So the, really the most efficient services use fleets for multiple different business models. A lot of the way that people evaluate whether a new mobility service is successful is by the utilization rate. It's not just utilization rate, because Hertz will tell you we get a 90% utilization rate on our fleet, but on average they make about $12,000 a year for a vehicle. Uh, if you are renting a car by the minute for, say, $0.41 cents a minute, and you get $0.15 cents utilization rate, 15% cents, uh, utilization rate, that means it's somewhere around $30,000. There's a lot of money to be made from these vehicles pushing up utilization rate. If you look at uh, the, the gray line represents um, actual services that are powered either by single service, uh, by some competition, um, those have pretty low utilization rates. Being able to layer the different services all on a single fleet of vehicles is the, the key to getting them up. So I'm with a company called RightCell. Um, we were founded in 2009. Uh, the name ride sell means get a ride with your cell phone. So we've been thinking about this business for almost 10 years. Uh, we've delivered over 25 million rides and rentals. Um, we're based in San Francisco now with 120 employees. Uh, just last week we announced our Series B funding of $28 million. Uh, we talked about ReachNow being our uh, BMW uh, platform here in North America. We're also powering AAA, their gig, as well as uh, Renault um, has launched in Madrid with a company Ferrovial, and those are 250 mile range electric vehicles. Madrid's a very progressive city that says if you have an electric vehicle, you can park anywhere, so there's a number of different services. People love long range EVs because it gives them, you know, basically no range anxiety. So it's a great service. These cars are being used up to 10, 12 times a day, so it's fantastic. On average, a uh, typical car share car will take between nine and 12 cars off of the streets because people find that they can get rid of a second car and just use these on a sporadic basis. Um, our new investors we announced, Cox Automotive uh, was the lead. Uh, Penske is very much involved with both their you know, automotive group and their truck group. 
uh, and corporate level. So we're seeing lots of interest now amongst the leading auto dealerships saying, hey, how do we play in this value chain? It's really important to make sure that uh, when you're looking at an on-demand platform, you have both car sharing and ride sharing as a part of what you can do because you need to be able to mix and match and stack these. Uh, and again, there's lots of different business models. Um, car sharing has station-based and free-floating, um, ride sharing, of course, and then autonomous ride hailing. The platform really needs to do these things. And the focus and the reason most of these companies are working with us is, again, they want to get to the particle, which is autonomous ride hailing. And if they don't get in the business now and start doing this, then by the time all the teachers come together, they'll definitely be left behind. And the autonomous pieces are key because it really takes the best of car sharing and it combines with the best of ride sharing. If you think about it now, when you walk up to an Uber, the window rolls down, it's like, hey, are you Mark? Yeah, are you Jeff? Great, let's get in. When there's no driver in there, you don't want anybody just to walk in and get in the car and go. So we'll use the technology that we use today, which is you walk up to the car, you get on your phone, you press unlock, the door opens, you can get in and go on your merry way. So the things that we're doing for car sharing today become highly relevant once you take the driver out in autonomous ride hailing. So the, you know, the service allows car sharing, ride sharing, car rentals, autonomous, all from a single app, um, powering multiple different mobility services. Uh, sometimes people think of us as an app company, but um, as a SaaS company, in fact, the app is the least interesting part. Uh, we've made it so that our customers can write their own apps um, to our backend platform. Things like the ability to onboard customers from, you know, take a picture of their driver's license, they take a picture of themselves, and they take a picture of their credit card, and within two minutes, we've figured it all out. Do they have a clean driving record? Do they have uh, ability to pay for these rides? And boom, they're able to get into a $50,000 3 Series and drive off. That's pretty remarkable in this day and age to be able to download an app and take a $50,000 car out for a ride. Um, on the autonomous side, it's interesting. We now uh, are working with companies that are doing autonomous ride handling uh, in pilots. And one of the things that, that we've discovered is that most of the companies working on autonomous have taught the vehicles how to drive safely from A to B. But what they haven't thought about is, how do they teach these vehicles how to maintain themselves? What do they teach these vehicles how to take care of themselves if they break down? So part of our platform is to check to see what is, what is the meaning of the check engine light? Oh, I just got a notification that a sand, sandstorm is coming, the vehicle's pulling over. Our platform then hails uh, a driven Uber or Lyft so that the people can get out of the car and get safely home, plus a tow truck to come take the thing. And of course, the tow truck driver needs to use, guess what, the ride-sharing driver software to get to, the, to know where the vehicle is. And when he gets there, he uses the button that unlocks the vehicle. So it all starts to come together and really help out companies that have been focused on teaching you know, autonomous driving, but not all the other bits. Finally. Uh, we think that, that the evolution of these ride-sharing services, once they're autonomous, is going to take off. It's not going to be one brand for one country. Uh, because once you get the driver out and the vehicles become purpose-built for, you know, for driving you around, then you can start to see things like, well, I'd like a car that's designed to entertain me. Uh, once I can no longer drive, why not have a cocktail car? I'd love a vehicle sponsored by Tanqueray and you know, a little gin and tonic on the way home from work. Um, the, uh, the, there will be multiple different services that are offered in the vehicle. Um, I'd like a business class seat so that I can be in a pool vehicle, yet I can still take a conference call. You know, the vehicles themselves don't have to worry about seeing from the cabin anymore because they're using cameras on the outside. So the, the idea that one company can just buy people's mind share, when we saw the switching costs are quite low, uh, take the driver out, start to create services and differentiation on these autonomous vehicles. You'll need a number of different companies coming into the market saying, hey, I can, I can use my brand and differentiate the service. So we've turned our platform into a cloud with the ability to replace functionality in the same way that now nobody goes and buys you know, rack mount servers and puts them in data centers. They just decide to use AWS or Azure, or the cloud from uh, Google. So really, I think the important thing is to know that there's a baseline that you can just take for granted and then build the differentiation on top. 
So we're right style and we build the intelligent platform for doing this. Thank you. Um, so yeah, the first question that we have is, um, how soon will you see mass market um, autonomous use? What's the market for? Um, how soon um, will you see mass market autonomous use? So it's interesting. People talk about level five and when are we going to get there? Will we ever get there? Uh, if you notice, I talk mostly about these urban environments. And if you geofence an urban environment, you can actually do very well with level four. And so, uh, so there's, I think, two phases to autonomous and mobility. The first phase, we think, um, has applications for today's car sharing market. Just being able to put autonomous uh, technology in these vehicles and allow them to reposition themselves in the middle of the night so that when people wake up, they're where the cars, they want the car to be, not where it was left by the last person. So, you know, it's not just how do we get to the, the driverless vehicle. It can be definitely helpful for these interim use cases. And then once you realize that a lot of these rides are within city, city points that are in a geofenced area, Level 4 technology does a great job. I'm really impressed with what Waymo has been doing. They just placed an order for 20,000 cars, and they're quite actively shuttling people around uh, in cities. And we think that that has an ability to scale. So it's here um, sooner than we think. And the next question is, do dealers want to see a free-floating or station-based service? For dealers? Yes. Yeah, so uh, we think that if you're going to do car sharing, you need to do it in a free-floating manner. That's the highest utilization customers want the most. But dealers have a, a unique capacity to use this because they're still in the business of selling cars. So if you, we talk to the dealer, we say, look, you're doing two things wrong. When somebody does an internet purchase and they're, they're evaluating a car, the last thing you make them do is to test drive it. You make them go into the building and talk to a salesperson. Why not have your, your cars lined up so they can download the app, walk up to it, get in, and just take their 15-minute test drive without having to involve somebody. That's the modern way. And then the second thing you're going to want is you're making them come to you. Right now, services come to the people. So put your cars around the city and say, hey, would you like to go for a test drive? Here's the QR code. Download the app. Take a picture. Take a picture. Boom, you're in and test driving the car right away. So being able to use technologies that are for new mobility can also help dealers with their existing businesses uh, today and help them bridge that gap. All right, thank you very much.